Okay, welcome everyone um, to this webinar by Community Law Scotland. Uh, we will take a couple of minutes to just allow everyone to uh, sign in to the session and then we will start um, the webinar. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone again. Just a few more moments to allow more of those who signed up to join and we will start. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kristina Nitsilova and I am the Urban Development Officer at Community Land Scotland. Uh, this is our fifth uh, webinar uh, in the Meet the Pioneers series, where we hear from community landowners across Scotland um, uh, about their experience and different projects that they're delivering. Um, today we will focus on community ownership of urban green space assets. Um, and just to start the session, um, a bit of background around Community Land Scotland. We're the collective voice for community landowners throughout Scotland. Uh, we raise awareness about the benefits of community land ownership. We support communities on their journey to achieving ownership of land and assets. And we also influence policies around land reform. Uh, we are a membership organization and we have over a hundred members spanning both rural and urban areas. Um, as you can hear from my job title, uh, my focus is uh, urban, um, the urban context. So um, for the last five years, uh, urban groups have been able to access the funding and the rights to purchase land and buildings, just like rural groups have been for much longer than that. Um, and this year in March, we um, published a report looking at the first, the early successes of communities that have purchased uh, different assets in the urban context with the help of the Scottish Land Fund and the various legislation. And so now almost 20% of the assets and land that is owned by communities in Scotland is in the hands of groups in urban areas. So these are towns, cities, um, so, through our experience with working with groups, we know that um, a lot of communities value their green space and want to preserve it and develop it as a community as community assets. So today we are really delighted to have uh, three groups uh, joining us to share their experience of purchasing and developing different different green space assets in different uh, urban contexts. So we have towns and we have a city. Uh, but before I hand over to our speakers, a bit of uh, housekeeping. So um, as you can see, a brief outline of the agenda is on the screen. Uh, we will have plenty of time for presentations and then um, a Q&A session. Uh, if you have questions throughout um, the presentations, please use the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will pick up uh, any questions at the end after all the speakers have finished presenting. Um, if your question is uh, targeted to a specific speaker, please ad identify that in your question. And for any kind of general chat or sharing information or links or anything like that, please use the chat function, which again is um, at the bottom of your screen there. Um, and yes, the session will be recorded and then uploaded on our Vimeo channel. So you can see on the screen here, um, you can search uh, for Community Land Scotland in Vimeo for, for that. We will also send a follow-up email with the link. And if you want to follow us on social media for any updates on community ownership and land reform, here is our Twitter account. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, this is Bill Anderson from Kaluk Development Trust. Um, 
Morning, everyone. Um, as Christina said, I'm Bill Anderson. I'm the development manager for Kurluk Development Trust, which unsurprisingly is based in Kurluk, um, but supports the communities across what's identified locally as the parish um, of Kurluk. And um, for the last four years, we've been um, developing the thing that's on your screen at the moment, which is the Kurluk High Mill and, and one Kurluk community growing and learning garden. Um, I take it does trip off the tongue a little bit, um, but um, I'll take you through some of the, the history and some of the activities and hopefully uh, generate some, some questions from yourselves. Uh, Kurluk Development Trust itself was established in 1999 and for the last 21 years has been involved in a number of, of activities. But that's nowhere near as long as certain members of our community have been involved in delivering, supporting, and keeping in the minds of our communities the Kaluk High Mill, which is um, an 18th century uh, land and building. And at the very beginning of this process, um, the first slide there shows a couple of things. One is about what the vision for the site was, which is around about maximum, maximizing the potential of, of what the community had identified as a national treasure. And to be fair, funders have also identified that. Uh, and that's predominantly around the buildings and around the mill tower. And the fact that it's one of the last remaining um, towers that were initially powered by sales and so wind power. So as part of, of the development, and I'll take you through that, that history as we go along, we are, we've kind of had to marry up the historic and heritage with the land that surround the buildings, um, which was very much a market garden. And so um, fruit, particularly strawberries and raspberries were growing around this area. So part of the, the process and marrying up the, the historic, the heritage with the land use and the growing and food production. So another vision for our communities is very much around about creating that new community growing and learning space. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is, is giving our communities more access to growing areas whereby they can contribute their time, their skills, their experience, their knowledge in physical activities that helps them to improve their, their mental health, their physical health, their well-being, but also begins to generate some revenue, um, which will be used by the, the the project in future years to obviously create a sustainable project. Um, we're also looking at, at rejuvenating the, the mill and there's a Tangi engine which is, is being stored by a local business which will be repaired, refurbished, reinstalled in the tower. But there are other things that this site and our community want to see happening. They don't just simply want a, a community garden. They want something that becomes an environmental and green hub. And, and there are a number of things that they're looking to do that will take you through the, the process around food preparation, food cooking, food storage, um, green energy. Uh, and I'll, as I said, I'll take you through in a little bit more detail as we go through the, the process. And, and as I said previously, that the, the site itself is very much a catalyst for the health and well-being of our residents, our communities, our, our partners. Um, but it's also about providing local training, education and employment opportunities. It's a huge site. It's 1.2 acres and it's smack by, it's 500 metres from the town centre in Kurluk. And, it's, and if you see the map or the plan that's in front of you, it very much sits within the centre of, of Kurluk. And as Kurluk has a population of touching on 15,000, 
it's quite a large town. And as you can see, um, the numbers 110, 86, 80, 12, they're all houses. So it's almost a green oasis in the middle of a number of housing developments. It also has two, sorry, three schools within five minute walking distance. Um, Curlook Primary School, Highmill Primary School, which funnily enough is right across the road from the Highmill and the Victoria Park Special Educational Needs School. So all of them, and again, I'll come back to them, are, are actively involved in this. And again, it's that thing about providing a hub for our communities. This is something that, that we're using as part of our, our conversations with our communities as we go through. And it's a 30 second video. Um, and what it, will do, what it does is it gives you a, a, a sense from a 3D flyover point of view of the site. And the buildings here, that's the tower, that's the Thresher barn, that's the Miller's cottage, that's the, the, the boiler room, that's the additional element to the Thresher barn. And then all of this here will be will be brand new and will be constructed. Um, this is a, what we're calling a changing facility, which is a high level, um, multi-accessible toilet facility. This here is our outdoor classroom, which is very much around getting school children out from, from school, out into the environment and being able to then have them um, have them accessing their environment and nature in a, in a very much more tangible and tactile way. Uh, I'll continue that now. Uh, this is very much our, our reception area. This area here is our what we're calling our community space and it has in here, and they've just walked in, is uh, uh, no, no, and, and is our uh, partners, the, the Clydesdale Food Bank, and we're building them a best built building, which will have a, a green roof, so it will be grassed with wild flowers. Uh, this is our Curlouk's Men's Sheds facility that, that's being placed in this, this site here. These are all car parking for, for individuals, so it gives you a sense of this this site, uh, again, as I said, these are all houses um, that surround the site. Um, and previously, all of this land was attached to this and part of the market garden. So it's a reasonable large site. And whilst I keep saying that, we, we, we are now struggling for space. So a little bit of background. The mill itself, and, and just in a minute, the mill was built around about 1800s. It was owned by a private family. It, it, actually, the, the, they have the barony of Kirkton, um, and actually they have to have a, a, a piece of land in order for them to retain their barony. So even though we own the land, it, it, there's a bit of it that's still owned by, by the family. Curlouk community uh, and certain members of that community have for four decades um, been involved in saving the mill, um, keeping the mill in the minds of the local community, um, holding events. This isn't something that, that, that's happened over five, six, seven years. It's happened over the last 40 years. And I guess what's ha happened to make it become a reality is, is when we started to talk to Scottish Land Fund. And that's where the interesting element of this is that a lot of the community were focused on saving the mill buildings and saving the, 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 the tower, quite rightly. However, in order for them, funders were, were at that time reluctant to contribute to the repair and 
construction of the, the buildings. However, what we discovered through the conversations with Scottish Land Fund was that we're quite, they were quite flexible in terms of allowing us to apply to the grant for funding to buy the land. And because the buildings sit on the land, then obviously they come with a package. But fundamentally, the application was to buy the land. Um, and to give you an example of that, the total purchase price for the land and the buildings was £241,000. £240,000 of that was for the land. And £1,000 was for this historic heritage building. I am not criticising anybody. What I'm saying is you have to be flexible when you're, you're putting together funding bids. You have to look at every opportunity to access grants, to allow you to get the bigger picture delivered. So we've had conversations through our conversations over the last three or four years prior to COVID, obviously. And fundamentally, because of the work of the individuals in the communities and keeping the, the mill in people's thoughts, we've had huge community responses about what they wanted to see on this. And very much it was around about they want more growing space, they want more green space, they want the help, they want the help, they want the mill developed, absolutely. But they were keen to see much more green space in Kerluk because there was a lack of it. So SLF provided us with the, the funds to, to purchase it. We then began development. So that was purchased in April 2018. We then began development of the garden because we had to go through planning permission in November 2019. And that was supported by SLF and by National Lottery and South Lanarkshire Council. The One Kerluk Community Growing and Learning Garden, and I apologise for the big acronym, folks, but it's... It, it's what it is, was, was opened on the first time in March 2020. Then our friend COVID-19 struck. Then it opened again for a short period in, in, in 2022, September to November. And then it closed down again. And then it reopened more fully from March of this year. So throughout all of that process, we were continuing to, to seek planning and listing building consents. And we got that in October 2020, which allowed us to then move into the next phase of the, of the process, which is about how do we take a site and begin to make improvements, not just to the land. And you can see there we got some money from the Community Climate Asset Fund to purchase polytunnels, rainwater capture systems, wood for raised beds, tools for the volunteers and, and peat-free soil. Um, but we were also able to then submit applications because we had the, the, the feasibility options report and the planning and listed building consents to Historic Environment Scotland, National Lottery Heritage Fund, Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, the Robertson, all of them that are there to start to repair, refurbish and construct both the existing buildings, but then to construct the new buildings, including what's called a Dutch barn construction, which will become our workshop so that the, the workers that are working on the stones are able to work within a wind and water type facility. And ultimately, once everything's been done in the buildings, that barn workshop will convert into our community performance and event space. So we'll be able to, to provide access to the local operatic group to various uh, and also be able to ultimately, and again, as part of the sustainability element, begin to provide space for events, weddings, birthdays, that sort of thing as, as we move through the, the future years. We've also been able, we've also been asked by and supported by South Lancashire Council to go for the Vacant and Derelict Land Investment Fund, which we've done. And that's to finish off, and I'll show you some of the, the, the work that's already been done, but it's to finish off the rest of the garden development. So it's about creating significant growing areas to the rear 
and um, putting in a, a series of, of paths and services around the water um, because the rainwater capture systems, whilst collecting the water, still need access to power to be able to distribute the water across the site. And, and one thing I learned, which I didn't know, was that you can actually use rainwater capture systems to flush your toilets. You can't use them to wash and you can't use them, obviously, to drink, but you can use them to flush your toilets. So again, that from our point of view is, a, is an added bonus. And just recently, um, and um, I may well actually, if, if you bear with me, it, on this one, this building here is an actual, is a house and that red line is the boundary for the, the whole site. And that house was owned by um, Jim McLaren and Georgina McLaren. And throughout the process, they've been fully involved in everything that we've been doing. In fact, Georgina used to provide us with pancakes and tea and coffee. Um, when we were having events, um, unfortunately, um, both Georgina and, and, and Jim are are elderly and and are looking to to sell on, and they've committed to selling the the house to the site so that it can become part of the the, the, the family of buildings. And we've approached Scottish Land Fund who have asked us to submit a stage two application and that's now been done and it's now in an assessment process. So potentially over the next couple of months, we may well be finalising the purchase and acquisition of that house, which means that the whole site will now be community owned and, and that makes a huge difference in terms of access to power, access to water, access to toilet facilities, access to, to more space to deliver more community activities and events. So over the last year, roughly, given COVID has stopped us in our tracks at various times, 300 community members have, have donated over 2,000 hours of their time, their skills and experience to get this site, which is what it was there, and that's the tower, which is partly demolished, and that's the Thresher Barn. And that's where the, the change place will be to this. So we've now created a new entranceway off of, of the main street. We've now cleared all of that land and put down hard standing areas. We've now got uh, two cabins to the left, which were donated to us as a temporary say what the first one is a steel cabin with steel doors so that's where our, our tools and, and equipment and everything is is stored that big pile there is is what's left of of the 60 ton of, of soil that's been spread across the various elements of the site. that big one there is all of the the soil that was excavated out of here to create this area and that is fantastic soil, as it was a garden, a um, market garden before. This cabin is our partner's food bank storage, where because of COVID, because of, of increased demand, they required somewhere to place a, an overspill. So we, we agreed that we placed it there. Those three things there, that are sitting quite lonely are our rain capture tanks. So they'll be installed. We've also created raised beds, including unique ones on stilts, which are these ones here and they're there. And these allow wheelchair users from our community and Victoria Park to push their wheelchairs underneath the raised bed and be able to, to take part in planting um, and tendering of plants. These are, this is the entrance, the pedestrian entrance to the site. And this was, was created, all of this was created by volunteers, as the picture on the left shows you. Um, this is our polytunnels. 
Um, again, volunteers in planting. And one of the things we created was what we called the One Kerluk Growing Army. And what that is, is that we have now 350 individuals across our community that were all given tomato and pepper and corn and um, strawberry seeds. And whilst we were in lockdown, they were all distributed January. Um, they were asked to grow those seeds to plants in their own homes, in their own greenhouses. And then um, just recently, end of May, beginning of June, they were asked to bring them up to the site to plant them, as you can see in the left-hand photograph. So now what we have in this polytunnel, which is 18 feet wide and 30 feet long, is we have almost 2,000 tomato, pepper, corn, and strawberry plants that are now happily growing away. And we will use the tomatoes and peppers to, to hold cooking classes, how to do pizzas, how to do, how to store tomatoes, how to store peppers, all of that stuff. And as I said previously, this will all be tied into our, our food hub, which is on the, the, the right hand side picture, which will include both the food bank and also a community kitchen and a community freezer storage area. Um, because a lot of people have very minimum freezer space. And so we'll be providing community space. But there is a real sneaky reason for that is if we have people cooking things and preparing things on site and then storing them into the freezer, they're going to have to come down and pick them up. So that means they're, they're coming back onto the garden and potentially they may well come up back onto the garden and decide to do something else. And one of the other things we're looking to do is that as part of the food bank's review of its services, um, a number of individuals in receipt of that service were embarrassed is probably too strong a word, but maybe that was their feeling about having to, to access uh, handouts as they saw it. And so one of the things we've discussed with our communities is that there's an opportunity that if they wish, they can barter their time so they can spend a half hour or an hour on the, the, the community garden um, in order for them to, to put back, to pay it forward, as, as some have said, in terms of, of the support that they're receiving from the, the, the food bank. We've got growing areas that are now starting to pop up. We want to have a, a series of small growing areas so that we can we can have multiple areas that we don't have to wait for things to grow. We can just do quick growing things, slow growing things in that variety. We're also setting up an apiary, which I didn't know was, was the, the correct term for a beehive. Um, and so we've got Lanark Beehive Society that's setting up five or six beehives in the back of the, the site. Again, what we'll be doing is, is creating honey, obviously, well, we want the bees, well, but we're going to steal it. And then we're going to create and sell on the site Kerluk High, High Mill Honey, which again is part of the sustainability element in terms of moving forward, because that's a key to any project like this. The other thing that we're going to be doing is we're working with local businesses to, for example, r and Scott, who make jam, and one of our polytunnels is going to be dedicated to growing strawberries that they will then, the five minute drive from us. So they'll take the strawberries and they'll create Kerluk jam, which they haven't created for near on 20 years. So we're bringing back Kerluk high mill jam as part, again, as part of the sustainability. So why on earth were we doing all of this? Well, we've heard, as I said before, we heard a number of, of conversations with our clients and our communities. And here's some of the things that, that they've said. Aileen Campbell, who's now left us, um, I think states that the best way is that there is a clear eagerness. We've confirmed that over several occasions to do better for the town. Our communities are active in that. They want to see that what they need is something that they can dedicate their time to and their, their physical activities to. If you look at the ones at the bottom, you're, you're, you're talking about 
skating about. People want to see much better access to to walking and cycling, and the, that that site will have electric e bikes. They want a, a bit of civic pride, and that that site will contribute it through hanging baskets, planters in the town centre, um, creation of fruit trees, orchards, all of that. Certainly more well-being. Somewhere for people just to get out the house is one of my favourite sayings. I just want somewhere to get out the house to. They just want apprenticeships, training, employment. They want all of these things. This project will do all of this as well as all of this. Their shops, close-knit communities, a heart because it seems to have lost it. So all of these things uh, are, are why we're doing this, because our community have asked us to do it. Um, I'm not sure how far I am into this. I think I'm about right. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm well, absolutely welcome any questions. Thank you, Bill. Um, thanks for talking us through this. Well, it's a huge project um, and hopefully that will inspire people to ask some questions. Again, use the Q&A box and we'll come back to them after all the speakers have finished. Um, and now from Kerluk all the way up to Aberdeen. Um, and we have John Wigglesworth um, from Bonnemuir Community, uh, from Bonnemuir Green Community Trust joining us to share their uh, experience of purchasing and uh, developing um, green space. So I don't want to <laughs> say any more. I just hand over to John, um, take it away. Thank you again. Hello everybody. Um, I'm just gonna try and share the screen. If you give me a second. And then uh, hopefully Hopefully this one will work. Um, yeah, I think it's starting to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can see your PowerPoint presentation now. Okay, so I'm going to swap between a couple of bits, and um, the screen behind me is um, is false, but it is actually part of a bookshop that I'm actually in, which is downstairs. So it's not all totally fake, uh, but. Um, with uh, information and um, and understanding how to communicate, I think are probably crucial in the lessons that we've learned. Um, the logo is where we've got to. Our our journey is a, a, a far smaller project than the, the fascinating Carl Luke one, and uh, you know we wish them all the best on where they've got to. Um, being smaller, it's required us to to be well uh, to to try and find resource where we can. Um, but our journey started um, in, like all stories, once upon a time in 1924. And in 1924, there was a lovely bowling green, uh, which was created uh, as a gift from a landowner. Um, and the first board of directors of the Bonnie Mill Green, Bowling Green, created uh, this bowling green, which sits just up a, a, a lane uh, surrounded by houses. And most people don't even know it's there. Uh, and it looked a lot like this. Um, and it was gorgeous. The sound of bowls, well, bowls were uh, hitting each other and all the neighbors were happy, uh, apart from when loads of people descended for parking. But uh, we were uh, generally very happy uh, with, with the bowling club. But unfortunately, the bowling club closed. Um, and that just created a bit of a shock around for all of us. So, um, we um, really had to think about well, what was the impact? Um, a few of us got together uh, and we contacted the bowling club and we asked if we could, well, what was happening? And they said, well, they can't get members anymore. Um, so to cut a long story short, you know, we offered to, to stimulate membership, uh, but the decision had been made and they'd also made a decision to sell to developers to progress it to uh, to be built onto flats, um, which we weren't so keen on. But uh, at this point, it's very important um, 
I think in anyone's journey to move from what might be seen as NIMBY or not in my backyard to something that actually has a purpose. Um, so we, in 2015, moved very quickly to, this is all just, um, um, I'll come back to there. That is what the green then turned into over the next three years. Um, I'll see if there's a, which is a, a very derelict, boarded up, uh, um, unused uh, facility. But uh, from 2015 to 2018 was the length of time it took for us to progress through, um, well, essentially one, um, having a town hall meeting with the community where uh, we established that uh, there was a desire to retain it for the community. Um, that caused us to form a steering group. Uh, the steering group, we included uh, as many people who felt they could bring skills or just wanted to be involved. Uh, it was very informal um, and it, it really, at that time, couldn't really do much because the bowling club would just not talk to us. Um, so we kept looking for avenues to progress uh, a community right to buy. The one benefit we had was that uh, uh, there was a, an oil and gas slump in Aberdeen. And so uh, there wasn't, a, the, the developer never progressed it. So the land laid unsold. Um, and in 2017, uh, or the legislation around about 2016, 17 changed. Uh, and uh, trying to see the bits. Yeah, sorry. 2016, uh, I intended a, 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 basically a, an awareness day, which was uh, organized by um, Aberdeen's third sector interface organization, ACFO, with the Scottish Land Fund. Uh, and um, really, that was the catalyst. We realized that because the law had changed, we now had a potential to uh, progress the community right to buy. Um, but what we had was uh, quite unusual because we had uh, we had no agreement. Uh, this wasn't a transfer of assets from the council. It wasn't uh, an, a, a landowner wishing to move the assets to the community. Uh, it was uh, the owner of the land not wishing to sell it to us and not wanting us to have us in the equation at all. So we, uh, we yeah we we had to get organised. Uh, and organized was the, was, was the key bit. And uh, the, the key people that helped us a lot in that situation were the Scottish Land Fund, uh, who gave us a, a lot of advice. Um, and, um, you know, where we went to this, it was, uh, well, what are we gonna do? You know, some of us are, are uh, professionals, uh, we have skills, but this was very much going into an uncharted area. So. We, uh, we got organized. Uh, we started fundraising. We look at resources, timescales, uh, and we uh, started doing things. Uh, the most important thing was communicating, communicating with your community. Um, because what, as an urban right to buy, uh, the one crucial thing we had to do was establish a community. So, you know, Karluk, um, if I thought was a, you know, a significant town, uh, we were trying to save a bowling green uh, into something. And what came through from our consultation with the community, um, we put forward various uh, options, was um, a community uh, market garden and a sustainable social enterprise. So we, um, you know, what helped us in this process, one was uh, organizations like Just Enterprise, uh, but the biggest help really to create that business, brilliant business plan was uh, we reached it out to other organizations and uh, don't, if you're starting this journey, you know, uh, yeah, do that. Uh, we reached out to Action 40, uh, who uh, had developed a brilliant business plan that we uh, took the structure of, and that was a very, uh, you know, it saved a lot of time and resource and, uh, we then created all our information uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to populate that. Just Enterprise gave us the resource so that 
we could concentrate on collecting the right information and shaping the plan uh, and uh, and they shaped um, the, the basic information that was needed um, but it took a lot of effort um, so you have to be yeah you have to be in it for the reasons to go the whole way um, so what this led to was success we uh we got awarded the right to buy. Uh, we then had to take that business plan for the right to buy with the Scottish land, with the, sorry, with the Scottish government. And within three months, we had to change it, take it into a social enterprise uh, to achieve the funding uh, from the grant that was given to us by the Scottish land fund and uh, lovely organizations like the Mushroom Trust. Um, and that, that really, you know, started our, our journey. Um, and just like anything, once you achieve success of some sort, uh, you have a wonderful feeling. And then you just, yeah, you just start to panic again. So, but don't worry. Uh, it's, uh, there are loads of tools to support you. Uh, because just like Carluk, uh, we, uh, we had the ability to buy the land, uh, but uh, and an element of refurb for the building uh, but, you know, we had to create a whole, um, yeah, basically a whole plan for what we intended to do. And that was all put in the social enterprise plan, which we're happy to share. Um, what I can say, really, to, to skip right to where we are now is that in that plan, um, we were going to create uh, a community market garden, uh, a sustainability hub, an education center, uh, and we were going to have um raised beds children's play area uh, a working cafe workshops art um a workshop uh, to upcycle furniture uh, and also a, a polytunnel and an apiary um and from september 2018 to uh june 2021 uh, we have achieved all of that uh, and we've achieved all of that because you know we've followed the plan uh, we've updated the plan as necessary uh, we've spent a real lot of time focusing on revenue generation sorry not a lot of time we have focused on revenue generation to show that we are not just relying on donations uh, but we have approached the rice grants um, uh, you know we're very we're in a, a great a very good position now that uh, you know everything that we've done from the door-to-door -door canvassing of all of that area uh, to the electoral reform vote that was overwhelming the support of what we're trying to do um, to the constant communication we do with our members and the wider community uh, because um, sorry jumping back to uh, um, creating an urban community. Uh, and this was absolutely vital in winning the right to buy this. We had to define by postcode what our community was. And we had to start, which I actually think is quite straightforward. You can do that, for instance, by going by community council areas. Um, but community council areas can be huge. Uh, and, uh, you know, our community council area was over 12,000 residents that we would have to canvas and get on board. So we defined a community of around about four and a half thousand residents uh, that we thought was manageable in terms of door-to-door uh, -door canvassing. Uh, and it really was as practical as that. Uh, we will be looking at that to widen that. And we do, of course, take membership from, from uh, all over Aberdeen and the surrounding area. But the most important thing for us was getting the Bonnie Mill Green open to the, to the community. Um, so, yeah probably jumped about a bit there. Um, so we own this, we wanted to uh, achieve something with it. Um, we put in a project plan. Uh, we started with 20 volunteers. Um, and we now have, I will just come out to hopefully here. Um, we now have um, over 385 members, we have about 100 volunteers uh, who are uh working uh, in the cafe um or in the garden um and you know the 
vaccines at all times are our, our, our aim uh, and sorry, our, what we're about, which is really to, you know, this is everything that's on there, but the most important bit, there's a comma to go in. This is a, a draft of the, the website that's going live, but uh, it's really to encourage fun, good health, well-being and sustainable living. Uh, you know, we are not um, overly uh, dogmatic in any way. We are just uh, an open community uh, that are tolerant uh, of um, anybody coming in for whatever reason, as long as it is uh, um, yeah, positive uh, and not illegal. Um, um, hi, John. Just to say that we can't see uh, your website. What we can see is your the presentation, just in case oh, you want okay. to share something right. else. Sorry right. to interrupt. I wonder how I, if I close the PowerPoint, maybe that will do it. You might so have to screen. stop sharing screen and then share a different one, potentially. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Thanks okay. for coaching. No worries. There we go. So... This is where we are and uh, what we've achieved in that two years that allowed us to get to, to the, the position we're at is that, uh, you know, we recruited a project coordinator. Uh, in 2019, we, we established 24 veg beds. Uh, we increased, increased the membership to 240. Uh, we secured the funding for activities for 2020. We introduced Pick Our Own Veg initiative, which was just, we walk in a, uh, um, we're not an allotment in the sense, all our, we, we always agreed that this was a community garden. You don't come in and own a bed, uh, you come in and just help the community. Um, so, you know, anyone can walk in right now and there's a board which says what's available to pick and there's bags and you go and pick what you want and you leave a donation. Uh, and, you know, for instance, in 2020, I think we had uh, 100 kilograms of potatoes picked and they were hand picked. So, you know, kids had to get their trowel out and um, go and pick their potatoes with their parents. They had to pick beans off the, you know, off the plants, uh, strawberries uh, from the runner beans. Um, so we put in a polytunnel, we've established the growing program. Uh, we had loads of, uh, um, well, we had a number of art exhibitions. And then the most important thing at the end of 2019 is we took, and we've done this every year, we do a survey of all our members uh, to really establish what is it that people want us to do the following year uh, that the board uh, can support uh, and we can work towards that. Uh, and in 2020, we then rec recruited two further center coordinators COVID hit, um, and initially we, we, uh, we shut, uh, but then we thought, well, you know, we have to be the catalyst uh, for the community to feel safe to do things. So we introduced a booking system for the green and families could come and just have the whole place themselves. People could come by themselves, one hour slots, uh, and the green always remained open. Uh, we kept a, a skeleton uh, crew available uh, to do the gardening. And we actually ended up having more visitors in 2020 than we did in 2019. Um, we started our raised beds. We took it to a further, further level. We introduced different shapes. shapes. We introduced garden matting uh, uh, to allow disability access. And then our Bonnie Cafe, which was Saturdays only, uh, we opened to Fridays and it just became hugely successful. Um, you know, we now have, uh, and the most important thing about the cafe and everything, it's completely manned by volunteers uh, who sell baked goods, uh, baked by the community. Uh, we do buy some stuff in, but just bacon and rolls, and we, we buy them from other social enterprises. Um, in 2020, we got funding, sorry, in 2019, we got funding for an apiary in wildflower meadow. Uh, the wildflower meadow was planted um, and uh, we didn't do the bees because uh, COVID was there. But um, at the end of 20, 2020, uh, we, uh, well, that's the other thing we introduced actually in 2020 was we did a, a series of summer and autumn nights where 
uh, we put up marquees, uh, we cooked very simple food, we got ourselves licensed, and we recouped all the losses uh, that the funding had. And it was a really wonderful community engagement. Uh, people came, it was all COVID uh, appropriate. Um, and yeah, at the end of 2020, we undertook our survey and that's what we're progressing in 2021. Um, and into June 2021, we now are open seven days a week. Uh, our cafe is open three days a week. Uh, we are uh, also open the other days for, uh, for drinks and for, for coffees and for cakes. We have a lot of people of, uh, we have young people, old people, people of all ages, uh, people who are on their own, people who are you know, come with family. It's, uh, it's turned into a very special place. Uh, and it's really just down to the, the community, uh, but it's also down to the support that we've had from the, the Scottish Land Fund. You know, that bit at the beginning, uh, the belief that we could do it, the, the, the team that uh, gave us a lot of information, it, it can't be understated. Uh, but for us, every time, uh, the one thing we would say is, uh, you know, try and get a, a good team, keep a community focused, keep it simple, uh, uh, don't be afraid to ask for resources, um, never underestimate your own uh, drive, um, and it's okay to feel stupid and if you don't know about anything, just ask. Um, you know, we're all volunteers, so no one can fire us, um, no, one, no one walks out, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just a special place. Um, so now, pretty much looks like that. Uh, and uh, that's the, the bees are just over to the left of that, uh, that butterfly. Uh, they weren't in this shot, but we have two beehives now, three weeks in. Uh, and the one thing I would say about bees is make sure you do a lot of consultation with all of your neighbors. Uh, uh, it's a very positive project, but bees uh, do raise emotion. Um, and that wonderful butterfly you saw that was uh, sculpted by uh, one of the yeah one of the volunteers to the garden who took an old table and uh, uh, was you know it's currently out of work or not working um, and but was a, a sculptor and uh, yeah it's amazing what you can do uh, don't leave your brownfield state your space is derelict um, you know just try and get some community engagement and um, yeah go for it. I think I'll stop there if that's okay. Otherwise, I probably won't. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one John. thing, the one thing I should say, sorry, is uh, because of the success of the cafe, uh, we are we are now probably uh, we'll wait until the end of the year, but we're, we're well, we are pretty much sustainable in terms of all the people we employ and all the activities we do uh, to be able to, you know only sort of look for funding for unfortunately the one last project which is uh, that roof on the left of that workshop and the roof, main roof uh, but in terms of all our running costs where uh, we uh, you know the cafe delivers that um, and uh, you know you do the right cafe it can work for you very well so I hope I didn't overrun <laughs> thank you thank you John it's amazing to um, see how how much you have achieved in the last year in spite of all the restrictions, I guess, and all the barriers. Um, well, now we'll um, hand over to our next speaker uh, from Helensburg Community Woodlands Group, um, who have acquired their land most recently, I think, out of the three groups that we have here today. And um, I won't say any more. I'll just hand over to you, David, and um, Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christina. And uh, it's been very interesting listening to John and Bill um, about their very sort of positive outcomes that they've had from their experiences. And I like to say we've had something similar, but in a different context. Um, I'd like to sort of follow through the questions that um, Christina sent me because I found them very useful. It helped focus my mind so that I don't wander off topic. So if you please excuse me from highlighting the questions and giving the answers, if that's okay. Um, there's a lot of similarities to Bonnie Muir, however, I will say about 
been unwelcome uh, by the, the woodland owners at the time. Um, anyway, my name, David Robertson. I'm, a, I'm the vice convener and treasurer of the Helmsburg Community Woodland Group. <clears throat> my past, I'm a retired forester, uh, previously with the Forestry Commission, who I worked with for 34 years. We are a community woodland group and also a SCIO. We're established with a formal constitution since June 2013. Prior to this date, we're more informal and a reactive group to the woodland owners who were basically housing developers and wanted to build houses. We're based in Helensborough, which is a population of around 12,000. <clears> we have a, around 80 paid up members uh, who are on our membership list that are contactable by email. We have been the owners of Castle Woods since November 2020. It was interesting to hear Bill talk about a huge site of five acres. Well, I refer to Castle Woods as only two hectares in size, but it's partially an ancient semi-natural woodland. It's an open space protection area, as well as having a TPO designation on it. Uh, we have a board of trustees who are make the decisions. We're made up of a convener, uh, a vice convener, of whom I am, and the treasurer, membership secretary, and an events organizer. And we also have other advisors to help assist us. Question was, how did the idea of a community buyout come about? Well, we were concerned that the owners who were housing developers would continue to apply for housing development and threaten the infrastructure of the woodland itself, which are Castle Woods. One of our members, fortunately, uh, was well-versed with the developing legislation, which um, I think it was John highlighted quite clearly, uh, the community right to buy. And as a group, we felt that the ownership route was a better, would help remove the threat of development from it once and for all, and enable us to put a sustainable woodland management into practice. Uh, and for the benefit of the local community, we also felt we had the right skill set to take on such an endeavour. So we were also asked who owned the land before we purchased it. The building company purchased the woodland from the Ministry of Defence. The MOD had originally owned it as part of their housing development, which was specifically made available in Helensborough to facilitate the naval families and the naval staff that worked at Fire Fast Lane which is five miles up the road. <clears throat> As a community, we, we enjoyed recreating in this woodland for many years and were concerned at the potential loss of this facility to a building developer. So we were asked, <clears throat> how did we develop our plans? Excuse me a minute. As part of our op opposition to the application for the developers to build 60, and I quote, 60 houses, it became clear that in, instead of just opposing housing, housing proposals by submitting our objections via the planning process, we should come up with a proposal as to what we would do as woodland managers ourselves, which is turning the negative into a positive, obviously. As a result of that, as part of the the threat from housing developer, we managed to hold public meetings to ask people what they wanted to do if we managed to own the woodlands. How would they, you know, would they support it? And their views and ideas and thoughts as part of this communication process ultimately determined their plans that we wanted to do on the ground. These plans were ultimately published in the local paper, which was had a circulation list of about 13,000. These plans included construction of an all ability footpath, which the woodland, the woodland currently doesn't have from one end to the other. Hydrological me me measures, because the woodland itself has problems with um, flooding in certain areas, but also when it's raining very heavily, downstream the houses down below suffer from flooding into their gardens. We want to put in new hedges, native hedges, native woodland, so that bird nesting species can enjoy them better. Boundary fences to help define the, the boundary itself. Removal of non-native laurel and rhododendron. There's, they're, they're quite predominant in the woodland. Um, and some selective felling and replanting of native trees. Similarly, we had existing dangerous and dying trees 
and these had to, had to be removed as a priority. We also wanted the Woodland to be provide an educational resource for local schools and linking into the Health Walk initiative. <clears throat> so the question was, how did we get the local community on board? Well, I think we had a great deal of support and there was a good lot of enthusiasm and interest from the public meetings that we held, especially because they were very anti the housing developer that was wanting to take place. Now, this housing developer had previously enjoyed a good public in it, a good public image and a good, you know, developing and managing houses in a positive way. But the but the loss of this woodland turned turned the turned the tables, you might say, and public opinion was genuinely and, and very much against them. So as also this, we also had to carry a, a funding. Uh, we had to carry a community ballot, which I think uh, uh, John mentioned, and that that made life easy for us in some ways because public opinion was with us. We produced leaflets, newsletters, et cetera, and letter, letter dropped immediate residents. That gave them the opportunity to be aware of our plans to buy the woodland, to question our plans and provide any comments. More importantly, I think, than anything else, they also knew who to contact as opposed to the owners of the housing developers who were anonymous and weren't contactable. So I think that's how we got local people on board. Community ballot proved that we were very successful. And again, like John, we had defined our boundary into a manageable area immediately around the woodlands themselves. We were also asked, where did we source our funding for the buyout and post-purchase developments? <clears throat> to carry out the ballot, we had to fund that ourselves, but we were very pleased to receive money from the Hugh Fraser Foundation, and there's over a thousand pounds towards the ballot cost itself. Ultimately, because we were found in favour and the people, majority of people supported our case, the Scottish government reimbursed us with that money, which was brilliant. However, to purchase the woodland, we obtained 95% of the valuation from Scottish Land Fund. The valuation of the woodland itself was 100,000, and we therefore received 95,000 pounds from the Scottish Land Front. <clears throat> this was under phase two. We had previously under phase one been awarded £9,000 from Scottish Land Fund. That was aimed at primarily to produce a 10-year management plan for the woodland, as well as pay for a valuation for the woodland and to pay for our associated lawyers' fees because we wanted to make them a formal offer, the landowners that is. Um, I think that process helped because it, it highlighted that as a group, it helped our credibility with the Scottish Land Fund. Uh, it showed that we were determined, we were keen to deliver what we say, and we were able to deliver projects as well as what we see in paper. We actually did it on the ground. We also team, ob obtained significant donations from within our own membership. Again, that reflects the passionate commitment of the local community, as well as the Mushroom Trust to help make up the balance of funding. As part of the acquisition, our lawyer's fees of £5,000 were 95% funded, as was the insurance policy of £500, and we had safety tree failing identified, which cost us £21,000. So <clears throat> as Scottish Land Fund funding was conditional upon being spent before the 31st of March 2021, we had to carry out the safety failing and pay for it prior to that date, which meant a quite a challenging task to manage that whole process. How long did it take us to purchase the land from the idea to completing the sale? Well, uh, we've been in existence for quite a good number of years because of the, the negative approach we've had to take with the housing developer wanting to develop on the woodlands. However, from my own personal memory, <clears throat> uh, it took approximately three years from, it, from our original approach to the woodland owners and wishing to make them an offer to buy the woodlands to us actually becoming the owners. I believe this was for various reasons. Um, first of all, the, the legislation development. Legislation was, was forming as we were basically going through the process. And as we were one of the first people to apply for it under the community right to buy uh, in a negative situation with a house where the landowners weren't willing to sell, I think they were trying, we were almost like uh, guinea pigs to some extent. Um, the owner's attitude, uh, obviously because like John, they didn't want us to make an offer. They weren't interested in talking to us. 
they didn't want us to buy the woodland because they had aspirations for making millions of pounds from building 60 plus houses. And I think as a group, we were also, this was all new territory for us, for us as well, as it was similarly for Bonnie Muir and indeed um, in, in, in Aberdeen and in, um, sorry, gentleman's name down in Carluke. These were all new to us. And so we had a, a degree of lack of confidence to say, well, even if we were successful, where would we find the money from? So I was also asked uh, what three hurdles we hurdles we faced in acquiring and developing the land. Our relationships with the owners were not good, especially with with, with us having community right to buy. Uh, they did not they didn't fully appreciate this legislation until they realised on one circumstances they required our consent in order to develop their land further. They previously had some development on it, and we'd allowed them to have some additional boundaries to take place. But they wanted us to give up more ground and realise the housing developer had to come to us to get our consent, to which we refused and said, no, we see that as an important, important part of our community right to buy. It's an important part of the woodland, and it's just as important to us now as it will, it will be forever, as a result of which you don't have our consent. That didn't exactly help our working relationships, as I'm sure you can imagine. But also, from their point of view, because they couldn't sell it to anybody else, they had to first of all offer it to us as a first stop. It devalued the value of their land. And this displeased them, obviously. They were also of the opinion that we would not be able to raise the appropriate funds. Well, that's their perception. The other issue that was a, pro a problem for us, a hurdle, is finance, as ever this is a problem for most groups. It can be a problem or a challenge. Basically, I think we see that as a challenge. And I think the other two groups that mentioned earlier, sounds like they've been very successful in overcoming these financial challenges. Um, so I think the key thing about the finance issue of it was, um, excuse me. Uh, I think the key thing about finance is legislation as it's developing, you want some legal advisor to sit down with you and say, well, you can do this, you can do that and do the next thing. And here's how I would advise you to go. That's fine. If you've got someone who's a friend or who's one of the community members who's a lawyer who's prepared to give his time to do that. Otherwise, they rightly charge you money for which money you might not have. But sometimes that's a security blanket, which certainly community groups do value and do appreciate. And I think if we could have had some a pot of money that allowed us to have legal advice free of charge, I think that would have helped us significantly. The obvious point, the other third point, which is an issue is organizing meetings under COVID-19. And, um, and especially with the wider community who we still need to engage with as much as we possibly can. <clears throat> Whilst Zoom is a very helpful medium and it focuses how you communicate within the time allocated, it's never as good as face-to-face. Unfortunately, this continues to be the case. And the final question I was asked was, so what are the main, what are the main benefits that community ownership of the land has brought to, to our community? Well, now that we've been, we've changed from being adversaries of the, the, the previous woodland owners, we as new woodland owners and as a community can now focus our time on the management tasks within the woodland in a positive light people now have direct access to the management decisions and can influence decisions that are taking place in the woodland. Whereas prior to that, they had no say, no input and no output. An example we've got is we're wanting to clear some of the laurel from within the woodland because there's a woman who is concerned that removal of the laurel from her back garden boundary, she has a perception that she has security at the moment. That's fair enough. This individual is now one of our trustees and she's now able to influence this work when we do it, if we do it, where we might do it as a priority, et cetera. What's important is we're able to now plan and organize fun days in the woodland. You know, we've moved it from being a negative scenario into a positive outcome, which is only good for the community. I think one of the challenges is also for the community residents nearby to understand they've now got a right to comment, they've now got a right to plan and to do things in the woodland that uh, previously they had no input to whatsoever. It's also nice to be said to talk positively about the woodland rather than negatively when the, by the previous owners. 
And I think that's all I would like to say, but genuinely welcome. Um, welcome any questions that people might have. Christina, back to you. Hi, thank you. Thanks um, for running us through your process. Um, and if I would please also invite Bill to the screen. And I believe John will have to, to leave us earlier because of other commitments. So um, that's okay, just one second. Um, and so, yeah, we've had a couple of questions in, uh, in the Q&A. One was around um, developing a revenue st stream for, uh, well, revenue generation and kind of working towards the sustainability of the organization. And obviously, um, Bill, you and Carl look a bit down, further down the line on that journey. And I wondered if you wanted to, I guess, highlight the main sources of revenue that you, you might be able to generate yourself. Thanks, Christina. Um, it's, it's always been an issue in terms of projects like community gardens and, and, and elements like that, that um, whilst initial startup funding is, is, is there and you, if you, if you access it, that's fantastic. There's always that worry that if you don't identify sustainability at the very beginning, even before you start applying for funding, then you're too late. Because um, A funders would like to see you and those, those thoughts and those discussions and absolutely correctly. But B, it also means that you need to have conversations with partners and agencies that, that potentially in the past, you wouldn't have thought needed to be involved. For example, the, the council. So some of the things that we've we've investigated, researched, and we'll be putting into our five-year sustainability and delivery plan is, is things like the obvious things I've already mentioned around the honey and the jam and the and the the the, the, the plants and the, the hanging baskets and all of that from the garden and, and the potatoes and. I was really interested in Jones because that's something we want to do. We want to, to take it. We've got that's huge. This and I know it's relative, David, in terms of, of the size of our site, but it's it's still big within Kerluk. So there's an opportunity for us. And so we've had conversations with local businesses because the other side of sustainability is a horrible term called displacement. Is that you need to be very careful that you're not utilising grant money to displace businesses or services that are already within your area. So we've got a, a fruit and veg um, small shop, which has actually just started up in the last three or four months. And the owner of that shop, Brian Clark, who I know very well, and we've, we've had umpteen... Um, events with Brian is a very good one. Um, so what we've agreed with Brian is that we'll provide him with fruit and reg on a consignment process so that if he doesn't sign it, uh, sell it, that's fine. We'll only get paid if he sells it and we'll also allow him to put a stall up on the site to, for his fruit and veg as well so that to, to leave it somewhere. But Main things around about are, for example, we've got a number of, of uh, community groups that are joining us in the partnership, and they're all coming with their eyes wide open that they will be asked to contribute towards a leasing costs. So it's either leasing the, the, the premises as we're building them, or it's leasing the space on which they want to place temporary cabins and things like that. But those discussions have already begun and we've already got them in. So what we've done is we've we've then taken that as a as one element of that. We then add in the, the event space that potentially in future years will we'll provide ample opportunities for for communities and wider to come and and have weddings and birthdays and things like that. And we've also talked to the again around about displacement because the council has a big huge hall here. 
And we've had conversations with the Chief Executive Council to say, look, we, we shouldn't be in competition. You've got a bigger hall than we will ever, but there must be a way that we can, it's too big for a hundred people, for example, but our barn will be perfect for a hundred people. So we've had those sort of conversations, but it's very much around about, so contracts with the council in terms of hanging baskets up the town centre, discussions with local businesses about the cafe becoming a franchise, the selling of jam, the selling of products, the selling of flowers, the, the selling of, of uh, high mill related products, mugs, t-shirts. We've got a wee mouse as, as one of our one of our logo type things. Um, so, but you have to have those conversations at a very early stage um, so that you're, you, you're sitting with funders with a de high degree of confidence to be able to do that. This is how we're going to, because we've worked out, we've budgeted at approximately a hundred thousand pounds per annum to run the full site. And that includes the museums and the, the office space and all of that that will be created. Thank you. And David, did you want to come in on, on that question at all and share how you're planning? I would just I would just like to highlight it's very difficult. Well, we've only got two hectares of woodland and it's not pristine quality high value either. And of course, we've basically acquired it from stopping it being developed into housing. Um, but we have very limited opportunities of generating a, a revenue from a woodland that is effectively an environmental benefit um, as opposed to a commercial high value timber crop. So from in the woodland itself, there's very limited opportunities of actually generating any, any income other than perhaps firewood. So there's a, a limited resource. Um, so I think we're, we're not at that stage about saying, well, how might we generate more income to, we need to sort of have to open our mind and think very openly about it. To some extent, Bill, I'm not saying you've got an easy number, but you've got resources, you've, you've got things, your things you're producing. You've got a cafe, you've got things like that. Now, we don't have either of those things, if you see where I'm coming from. And it's more the community benefit of being able to recreate there, being able to enjoy it, where it's it, we were in danger of losing it. I think one of the benefits that, that we could get, which you might have might want to associate some sort of value on is maybe getting training and education from people working in the woods. That's a skill and an attribute which is, is missing and lacking in local people. So it depends to what extent you'd put a value on that. And I think it is quite valuable in some ways. So I'm sorry, we have limited opportunities, but we are thinking as positively as we can. Absolutely, thank you. David, sorry, just one thing you might wish to consider is, is the forest schools. Yep. In terms we've of. Already, yep, we've already engaged with the local um, coordinator uh, at Hermitage Primary School, and he's in touch with, an, well, we're talking about maybe having 400 children, believe it or not, in a week. I can't believe that, but that's fantastic. Um, so yes, thank you for that, Bill. Thank you. I think you had, Thanks. but I thought I'd raise it anyway. Um, it, it's amazing that you know you can uh, support each other in developing your own plans. So I, I encourage everyone to uh, who's a speaker today to ask each other questions if they wish to. So I'm great that you've take, great that you've taken me up on this. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the Q and A box. Um, one from Kate, uh, who's asking how best can community involvement help implement urban green space projects. And I think, Bill, you talked a lot around community engagement and so did you, David, but is there anything else you want to highlight on this? The only thing I would say in Helensboro, we're, we're different from Carlick, or not reasonably well, but there's quite a lot of groups that are active uh, actively involved in Helensboro. So we're just one of many in some respects. So I think it's important that you work together and share opportunities. We get members that are members of our group that are also members of other groups. So there is a synergy between the two, if you follow. And maybe that's something to build on, perhaps. I don't know if you've got similar situations, Bill. Yeah, we, I get, from our point of view, it's, it, it's very much about from, from day one, we've we instigated what we call the current conversations. And that's more about, and we kind of shifted the, 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 the emphasis of this. And the first one we said to people, which normally consultation processes do is, 
what would you like to see happening in Kurloop? What would you like to see better in Kurloop? What would you like to see delivered here? And, and we went across the whole parish and all that. And then we got a number of things, including the high mill and, and green spaces and all of that stuff that, that I'm quite happy to share with anybody that's, that's interested. <coughs> but the second one, we slightly shifted the emphasis. We asked the same, well, basically the ethos was, you said, we did, this is what happened. But what we also then said is, what's next? <coughs> and we slightly, because I'm, I'm a person that does this, is what we said to people is, it, not in these words, but it's, we don't want you just to tell us what more you want developed and delivered. We want you to tell us how much of your time, skills, experience, and knowledge can you help and invest in this process to make that happen? So what we decided to do was to, to and I, I probably don't mean it this way, but to stop continually keep asking our communities what it is they want us to do and shifted it to say to them, well, what is it you want to do and how are you going to contribute towards that? And how can we help you contribute towards that? Because some people will require some additional support and things like that. But if everything has to be about two things. One is raising people's positivity, gathering their views, but also managing their aspirations and those those motivations. Because a perfect example is the Kirk Haimel, is that you've got a community garden that we can get onto and we can do loads of stuff and we can keep doing stuff without any impact on the buildings. But you can't do the same speed with the buildings because they're A-listed, because you've got to go through conservation, you know, all that stuff. But the key is, is that if you link the garden to the buildings, then people see activity happening. It doesn't matter how small or how unrelated to the building it is. What that means is people then come on and say to us, and we've had it on a regular basis, when is the work going to start in the buildings? And you're able to say, well, this is why we're, we're having to wait now. And it just gives people a little bit of comfort and a little bit of confidence that things are moving forward and they can see machinery and they can see volunteers and all the garden, they go, well, at least something's happening. Because that was the biggest issue that people had is that this has been going for 30 or 40 years. And it was always a case of that there was a, a bit of a spark, a bit of a peak, then it went to a trough or nothing happened for a few years and then another peak in it. So what we've, we've tried to do is to work it in such a way and plan it in such a way that there's a continual, as much as we can, level activity process. Good. Thank Good. you. <laughs> Did you want to come in on that again, David, or? No, no, no I think David Bill's given a good example. I like, I, like, I like the point he was making really about, rather than people complaining about why you're not doing this and why you're not doing that, is turn back to say, well, what are you prepared to do about it? Come on, work with us and let's make it happen. You know, and some people are afraid to do that and hadn't thought about them doing it themselves. But I think that's the benefit through Kerlouk and indeed ourselves. We can do these things with them and they can step up and help us, which is great. That's the way to challenge it. I'm sure it's a positive way forward. Yep. Thank you. Um, and David, you spoke about the biggest hurdles and how we've overcome them. But I wonder if, Bill, you want to highlight maybe one biggest challenge and how um, your organization and community addressed that. I think our biggest hurdle um, is a fantastic positive, but it's still a hurdle, is the fact that we, we have to manage people's expectations, particularly around the physical buildings, because they are the iconic structure. They are the thing that the vast majority of the people that have been involved in this, as I said, for four decades, want to see restored, rebuilt, and, and, and all of that. And that has to go through a whole raft of very slow, very technical, and sometimes extremely frustrating processes. And at the same time, we've got our community saying they want to see the community garden and the growing areas and, and all of that. And we're able to do them much, much quicker than we can with the buildings. And it's about one of the biggest hurdles that is about managing those two different groups' expectations is why are you concentrating on the garden? Why are you not 
starting a building. And so from our point of view, it's been very much about communication. It's been very much about keeping the community on board. It's been very much about saying to them, this is your site. We're only a custodian of it. We, we are only owners of it because we've got the, the best structure for it at the moment. But ultimately, it will become community owned. So now's the time. And so we've continually kept them up to date. We've continually created um, activities in the garden, but we've linked them um, to the building so that when we talk about things happening on the garden, we have them next to the building and we, we keep people aware of that. So. And the other one, just if I may, Christina, is my goodness, do planners and, and historic environment Scotland, and I understand fully why they do this, but they are only half technical sometimes. And they don't seem to get that, that thing about, they're getting better, about how communities are willing to do stuff out with what, what's happening. If we can just get things, I think they need the streamlining of it would be good, but I guess that's a wish that everybody has. <laughs> I'm sure that is a shared feeling indeed. Uh, we have a few suggest well, we have a suggestion uh, from the QA box in terms of uh, revenue streams, uh, considering a permaculture design space as, as an activity. And so I can share that information with you. I guess that's um, targeted at David afterwards. There is one question from Daniel in here around how, how can these projects that you've developed, you know, be, become something that can influence the, the wider development of, of your place, you know, of your town or your neighborhood, rather than just being a, a beautiful exception in, in his uh, words. And I guess, yeah, I mean, it will be interesting to uh, hear your take on that. You want to go first, David? I, I, I will do. Um, there's all, for, inter, for, for information, there's another woodland um, uh, in Helensborough, which is adjacent to us, which is known as Duchess Woods. And that's owned by Lus Estates. And previously and prior to a year ago, our Gale Butte Council had a management agreement in cooperation with Lus Estates. Well, there's a very active uh, management committee of Friends of Duchess Woods. Now, as I say, they're just across the road from them, from ours. But they, how can I put this? They don't see themselves in the same role. They, you know, there's nothing stopping them approaching Lus Estates saying, well, why don't we buy the woodland from Lus Estates and take over the management of it? And there's as well able and competent individuals amongst that group that, that, that they could do it with relative ease, albeit, again, they're a quite a bigger group. But um, I think they're looking at us as examples which might very well continue or spill over into their area as well too. And I, I'd like to think we we would be a good example to show to others to so that they feel confident about maybe taking on similar challenges themselves. Sorry. I guess I guess he's absolutely right. Is that a lot of projects get caught up in a dangerous process that they, they only see their project as the only project in town. And so we were very clear from the very beginning um, that that's not the case. And we've developed the, the high mill and the, the garden as part of the, the much wider One Can group, um, which, which has got NHS, council, businesses, community groups, all of that. And Kirk Highmill isn't isn't now seen. I don't think it was ever was, but sometimes you can get the danger of that it could be is is almost this this vanity project where it, it's a beautiful site, it's a beautiful garden, and once the buildings are all done, it will be beautiful. But it's now encompassed within the place plan processes. So we we're using the place standard tools to continue the development of Kaluk High Mill and continue the development of One Can and develop the town as a town and a community and a parish. And so when we talk about Kaluk High Mill, we talk about it as an engine, one of the engines of driving forward placemaking, driving forward the regeneration of the town and the parish and the community. 
and it's one element of it. It is not a standalone, and it will, it cannot be a standalone. It has to be linked with, and we've already made that journey from concentrating solely on the buildings to now creating the community garden, which is supporting the buildings and the building supporting the garden, and then the garden supporting other growing areas within the town and within the parish, and then growing the town centre by, by providing resources for the regeneration of the town centre, physical, in terms of a new, a new pedestrian community space and, and things like that. So, so he's absolutely right, is that you have to, as much as you can, and it depends, and I, I, David's right, I'm lucky, I've got a fantastic resource, but you, need, you have to make sure that that resource is tied into everything else within the town. And that it doesn't become detached from your overall town regeneration, because you will very quickly lose people if they only see it as something that you you just want to develop. You want all this money, but there's no link to the town, no benefit to the town. It's probably a better way of putting it. Excellent. Thank you both. I've just become aware of the time, so I think we'll wrap it up here. There were a few more questions that are a bit more. Um, technical in the chat box, so I will direct them to the speakers um, afterwards and we'll uh, get back to you on some more specific questions. Thanks to Bill and David and John, who sadly had to, um, to rush. Um, this has been hugely insightful and we have many requests to upload this uh, presentation immediately onto our video channel for <laughs> a rewind. Um, that, Thanks again. And um, for those of you in the audience who are based in Glasgow in the Clyde Valley, we have a follow up event next week on the 7th of So if you're interested, find out more, you can um, find it on our Twitter page. Um, and yes, um, I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, thanks to Bill and David. And um, keep thanks, an eye Christina. on. Nice events. to meet you, David. Nice to meet you too, Bill. <laughs> and you, Kerry. Yes, thank Kerry behind thank the you. scenes. Thanks, <laughs> y'all. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.